Be sure to watch until the end of this video where I show you how to get epic pictures of the moon through your telescope using just your cell phone. Hey everyone, John Reed here, author of the book 50 Things to See on the Moon. In this video, we're going to learn to observe the moon with a telescope. If you're new to telescopes, the moon is by far the best way to get familiar with your gear. But more importantly, the moon helps you build a deep appreciation for our nearest neighbor in space. And on many nights, the moon is so bright that it creates enough light pollution to obscure many of the other targets you might otherwise want to observe. So if the moon is in the sky, you might as well observe it. This is Learn to Stargaze. Now there's really two aspects to this video. First, there's the technical aspect, how to get the telescope pointed at the moon so you can see the craters and mountains. And second, there's the experience aspect, and that's about appreciating the moon at a fundamental level. The goal is not to just see the moon, but to fall in love with lunar observation so that it becomes something you come back to month after month and year after year, and something you can share with your family and friends. So first we're gonna look at the technical aspect. How do you find the moon and how do you point a telescope at it? Well, the moon is the most basic and easiest to find target in the sky. It's observable both during the day and night with or without a telescope. That said, it's important to understand that only for about 14 or 15 days is it visible in the evening sky right after sunset. Starting with the crescent phase through the first quarter about four days later, followed about seven days later by the full moon. Amateur astronomers become what we call moon aware. This means that you always know the current lunar phase, where the moon is in the sky, and what that means for you as a stargazer. For example, if it's new moon, the moon is hanging out near the sun, so you won't have any moon at all during the night. New moon is the best time to get out of town to a dark location and observe those deep sky objects like galaxies and nebula. A few days later, we'll enter the crescent phase when all sorts of different craters appear for you to explore. As each day and night passes, the terminator, that's the line between night and day on the moon, exposes more and more of the moon's surface. After the crescent phase comes first quarter, and then gibbous, and then the full moon. After full moon, the moon rises later and later each night. During this period, known as the waning phases, you'll have moonless skies until later at night, or earlier in the morning. Now if you're new to finding targets with your telescope, here's the process for looking at the moon. Point the telescope as close as you can toward the moon without any optical assistance. Then, center the moon in your finder. Once the moon is centered in the finder, move to the eyepiece for a closer look. Just use your lowest power eyepiece, that's the one with the highest focal length. For example, I've got a 20 millimeter eyepiece right here and that's just fine. If you've got a Barlow connected to your telescope, take it off. We'll use a Barlow only after you've mastered the use of normal eyepieces. If the moon does not appear in your eyepiece, that means that the finder scope and the telescope are misaligned. If that's the case, you may need to go back to video number 22 in this series on using a beginner telescope. And once you've got the moon in the eyepiece, check your focus. Make sure the moon is sharp. A low powered eyepiece should show the entire moon in most telescopes. If the moon is in its gibbous phase, that's when the moon looks like this, or when it's full, like this, the moon is pretty bright. Now, I don't think you can actually hurt your eyes by looking at the moon through a telescope, but it can cause a bit of discomfort. Also, at full brightness, some of the finer detail might be washed out. To address this, many beginner telescopes come with a moon filter or polarizing filter. These filters are sort of like sunglasses for your telescope, and they generally screw into the back of an eyepiece like this. Now, because they're polarized, they're really good at reducing reflected light, which all the moon's light is. The filters reduce glare and increase contrast, improving the view especially of the parts of the moon experiencing direct sunlight. Now another feature common on many beginner telescopes are these portholes in the mirror cover. Now because of how telescopes work, any light that hits the primary mirror forms a full image in the eyepiece. Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, if you're finding the moon's glare a bit too much, try popping off the cap and replacing the cover like this. Now, if your telescope didn't come with one of these, you can always take some paper and some tape and cover a portion of the opening, and that will work too. Now, the best part of observing the moon is getting those up-close views so you can really appreciate the mountains and craters as if you're in a spaceship flying over the moon's surface. You zoom in in two primary ways. The first is by changing to an eyepiece with a lower focal length, 
and the second is adding a Barlow. Now, as I said earlier, you always wanna start with the lowest powered eyepiece. That makes things easier to find, even if you're just buying the moon. If you lose your target, it's always best to return to this configuration and start over. Now, once the telescope is centered on the moon and you're ready to zoom in, loosen and remove the low powered eyepiece, in my case, the 20 millimeter. Then insert the higher powered eyepiece, in my case, a 10 millimeter eyepiece. The first thing you always do after switching eyepieces is to refocus the telescope. Also note that the telescope tends to focus to your prescription. So if you're stargazing with other people, you'll want to teach them how to focus the telescope as well. Now, once you've mastered observing the moon at this level of magnification, and you want to get in even closer, now is the time to add the Barlow. So remove the eyepiece, take your Barlow, put the eyepiece in the Barlow, and put the Barlow and the eyepiece in the telescope together. And again, you need to refocus the telescope after adding the Barlow. Now this is probably the most you'll be able to zoom in, and at this point you should be very aware that the moon is drifting across your field of view, primarily due to the Earth's rotation. So every 30 seconds or so, you'll have to adjust the telescope ever so slightly to compensate for that movement. Note that your telescope has a maximum useful magnification, which is approximately 50 times the telescope's diameter or aperture in inches. So this telescope here has about four inches of aperture. So the maximum useful magnification is about 200 times. So say you have a telescope sort of like this and it has a focal length of 600 millimeters. Using a 10 millimeter eyepiece, you'll have a 60 times magnification. So you're well under the 200 X threshold, even by adding a 2 X Barlow where you'll reach 120 magnification, you'll be fine. If you happen to exceed the maximum useful magnification with your telescope, the image will probably appear blurry no matter how well you adjust the focus. Now here's a pro tip. When observing the moon, I love to use these zoom eyepieces. This one's made by Celestron, but there are many others at reasonable prices. These work by twisting the eyepiece itself to change the focal length of the eyepiece. This one goes from 24 millimeters all the way down to eight millimeters, which gives incredible close-up views of the lunar surface. Now we're on to part two of this video, appreciating the moon. I've shown the moon to thousands of people at public stargazing events, and the response is almost always the same. Wow, cool, I can see craters. And then they leave. But there's so much more to the moon than craters. And even if all you care about is craters, there's a lot to these craters to learn and appreciate. One of the best ways to appreciate the lunar surface is to learn the names of all the prominent features that you can see on the surface of the moon. And this is where a book like 50 Things to See on the Moon comes in. This book is the main reason why this 50 Things series won the 2020 Simon Newcomb Award for Excellence in Science Communication. Now this book follows the lunar cycle, highlighting three or four of the best targets each day. Here you learn about the scientists and philosophers for which each of the craters were named. This book includes three views of each target. One for those using a refractor telescope, which shows a mere rotation, one for a Newtonian telescope, which includes a 180 degree rotation. And the large image is for binocular or spotting scope users, which does not include any rotation to the view. Another fantastic way to appreciate the moon is to draw what you see, recording your observations in your own unique way. Now I TA an introductory astronomy course at St. Mary's University, and many of the art students taking the course will paint the moon. And I've actually tried this myself, and it was a lot of fun. And that's why when we designed the 50 things to see with a telescope activity workbook, we included several pages dedicated to just drawing the moon. Now let's move on to one of my favorite activities, photographing the moon with a cell phone. So here's the setup. I've got a small telescope, which is, uh, this is just a spotting scope made by Celestron. I've got it on a computerized mount. You do not need a computerized mount. I am just using that for the purpose of, purpose of this video to make sure that for the duration of the filming, the moon is in frame. Okay, um, attached to the telescope, I've got my regular eyepiece right here. I'm using, in this case, a 24 millimeter eyepiece. Um, doesn't really matter as long as your telescope can get the moon um, in frame like we have here you should be okay i'm using an iphone adapter which i bought on amazon on amazon for about 13 dollars and then the iphone okay so here's what you're going to do you're going to set the phone to video mode you're going to click on the moon 
and make sure that the focus is absolutely perfect. Um, you may need to focus uh, your telescope. My focus knob's right here. Yours might be somewhere else. Uh, anyway, that that uh, photo needs to be in perfect focus. Then what you want to do is you use the light level feature to make sure that all the detail, um, even on the limb of the moon, is clear. So it's not uh, overexposed or anything like that. Now you're going to record a four or five second video. One, two, three, four, five, six, stop. Okay. Now we upload the video to the computer and we'll take it over from there. Once you've transferred the video file from your iPhone to the computer, drag and drop the file into a program called PIPP. Once in the program, select Solar Lunar Full Disk, go to the output, select AVI, select Do Processing, and Start Processing. This will convert the movie file from the iPhone into an AVI file that the stacking software, which we'll get to in a minute, can read. Now we're ready to stack the frames from the video into one image. We're going to use a program called Registax, which you can download for free on the internet. Once you've opened Registax, hit select and choose the AVI file you just created in PIPP. The first thing to do is tell the program to select the best frames. This will reject any blurry frames from the image. Then hit set align points and align. Now we're going to hit limit and then stack. Now this is where the magic happens. Click wavelet and slide these sliders over until the moon looks amazing. Slide them too far and the image will become noisy. Note that Registax is only processing the center of the image. To do the entire image, select Do All. When you're happy with the image, select Do All and then Save. Now you need to correct the orientation. To do that, open the JPEG, rotate the image so that the moon is right side up, in this case, the Sea of Crises is in the top left because I'm using a mirror reversing telescope. The Sea of Crises should be on the top right. So I'm, go I'm going to flip the image so that the moon is now in the correct orientation. Then hit save and view your final image. That's all there is to it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If this video really helped you out, you can support me and my stargazing endeavors by purchasing a copy of 50 Things to See on the Moon or any of my other books. Also, please consider subscribing to Learn to Stargaze here on YouTube. And remember, the future is looking up.